All right, Wakenda, it is good to see you guys tonight. Honored to be with you guys. I feel like I've made it to the mountaintop to have been invited to preach at Wakenda. Um, man, I'm still so proud to see Wakenda moving and growing strong, uh, to see where, where you guys have started. You guys took off and to see that you guys are still here um, and that Wakenda is more than just literally a group on Facebook, but we are a movement of um, people who are not afraid to embrace our faith and Christ, uh, so honored to be with you guys tonight. Um, to all of our Facebook viewers and everybody out there, shout outs to you guys. I wanna take a quick moment before I hop into this word to thank my friend, Pastor Christian Josiah, and to thank Saba uh, for the invitation to be here with you guys. You guys continue to manage this group and uh, what I call this church. And so, you know, super grateful for your ministry. So shout outs to everybody on Facebook. I'm gonna hop into this word real quick, um, but before I hop into this word, um, actually we're going to hop into the word and then we're going to pray. All right. So let's hop into this word tonight. If you have your Bibles and you're able to reach across to grab your Bible, whether it's on your phone or in your hand, um, let's take a look at Acts chapter 28, verse three through eight. That's Acts chapter 28, verse three through eight. All right. So if you have your Bibles, let's go ahead and let's take a look there. All right. That's Acts chapter 28, verses three through eight. All right. By the way, my name is Abraham Henry. I'm privileged to be with you guys. I am originally a New Yorker by trade. That's where I grew up. I'm originally from Brooklyn, New York, um, but I have the privilege of being able to serve as the youth director here in the Lake Region Conference. We cover five states, all right? So just telling you a little bit about my area, our five states are uh, Illinois, uh, we have uh, Indiana, we have Michigan, we have Minnesota, and uh, we have Detroit. So uh, good to see you guys. All right. Once again, glad to be with you guys. So let's go ahead and let's take a look at this word. That's Acts chapter 28, verses three through eight. I believe we got a word from the Lord. So the Bible says, but when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, a viper came out because of the heat and fastened itself on his hand. And when the natives saw the creature hanging from his hand, they began saying one to another, undoubtedly, this man is a murderer. And though he has been saved from the sea, justice has not allowed him to live. However, he shook the creature off into the fire and suffered no harm, but they were expecting that he was about to swell up or suddenly fall down dead. But after they waited a long time and had seen nothing unusual happen to him, listen to this, they changed their minds and began to say that he was a God. Now in the neighborhood of that place where, in the neighborhood of the place where lands belonging to the leading man of the island named Publius, who welcomed us and entertained us courteously three days, and it happened that the father of Publius was laying in a bed afflicted with recurrent fever and dysentery. And Paul went in to see him. And after he had prayed for him, listen to what he did. He laid his hands on him and healed him. I'm going to repeat that last phrase. This is what he does to the guy. The Bible says he lays his hands on him and heals him. I want to just speak for the next few moments on the topic entitled on the on, on the message entitled you can catch these hands that's right you heard me you can catch these hands amen let's pray together let's pray really quick father in heaven we are so grateful to be in your presence tonight god it has been a long week but father we are grateful to be in your house your house is where your people are gathered which means it doesn't matter what zip code or area code we live in it doesn't matter what state we're located in or what country we reside in what matters in is, is that we are a group of believers and we are here with you tonight. And so Father, we're grateful to be in your house tonight. And we ask in a special way, someone came needing, not wanting, but needing a word from you. And so Father, I pray in a special way, God, that you would think through my mind, God, that you would speak through my lips and that you would stand in my body on tonight. In Jesus' name we pray, let God's children say the words, amen. Just type amen real quick in the comment section on Facebook, all right? Once again, the message is entitled, You Can Catch These Hands. Let me highlight y'all for a quick second and let you guys know the backdrop behind this story. I need y'all to understand that Paul, y'all know Paul. Paul is in the book of Acts. You guys know Paul's lifestyle. And uh, you guys know Paul for a while is in a season where he's getting ready to face trial in Rome for his past. 
And while Paul is on a prison transport ship, that's right, I said it, he's on a prison transport ship. He's not on the Staten Island Ferry. He's not on a tour boat uh, in downtown Chicago. Are y'all listening to me? He's not on a Royal Caribbean cruise. Understand, Paul is on a prison transport ship. The Bible actually tells us that while they're on this ship, he has 276 other inmates. They're wearing their orange jumpsuits. They got shackles on their feet. They have handcuffs on their hand. These are individuals who are on their ship getting ready uh, to check into a, a, a prison. They're getting ready to face trial. Understand the Bible says a storm happens. Did y'all hear me? That's right. In the chapter preceding this chapter, they find themselves in the middle of a storm. And the Bible actually describes the kind of storm that they're in. They're in uh, the kind of storm where it seems to overshadow your daytime. In essence, it's the type of storm where even though it's daytime, it becomes nighttime. There is no sunlight. There is no moonlight. There is no stars visible. The Bible tells us that they are in a storm where it is complete and utter darkness. They can't see their hands in front of their faces. They're in this storm and they're not in this storm for a few hours, but the Bible actually tells us they're in the middle of this storm for 14 days. That's right. Y'all heard me. After 14 days, they, they're not able to see anything in front of their face. The ship is rocking and shaking. The ship is shaking and the ship is rocking. Understand they're wondering if they're going to make it out alive. Understand that food is scarce. Why? Because in order to balance the stability of the ship, they had to throw some food overboard. And so now they are in the middle of a storm. They are hungry. They are wet. They can't see anything in front of their face. But the Bible says that God reassures the end individuals on this ship that they are going to make it out alive. And I don't know about y'all, but we've been in the middle of a few different storms this year. We've dealt with a couple of storms. Some storms that we face is a storm of social injustice. We face the storm of COVID-19. We face the storm of some of us not having a chance to go to graduation. We face the storm of us having to cancel vacations. Uh, uh, we face the storm of us having some issues in our household because we've got too many people at home and nobody can leave the house because everybody's got to stay masked and everyone's scared about spreading COVID-19. Y'all know what I'm talking about. We face some storms this year. And I need y'all to understand that I want y'all to be encouraged that God promises us that we're going to make it out this thing with substance in our hands. And I need y'all to understand that the Bible actually says that there are a group of individuals who made it off this ship, but they made it off this ship to shore two different ways. The Bible says that some people swam to shore, but there were some individuals who could not swim. And because they could not swim, they made it to shore on broken pieces. And I don't know about y'all, but I've got to testify on my own tonight. I don't know if I'm by myself, but I am so grateful that I made it to shore and I didn't I didn't walk to shore. I didn't swim to shore, but I'm one of those individuals who made it to shore on broken pieces. Did y'all hear me tonight? I made it to shore on broken pieces. What that means is, is I didn't have it all together this year. Everything wasn't right this year. I had some disappointing moments this year. I had some things that shook my ship and, and that maybe seem to chip away at my faith, but I'm mad enough to admit that I made it to shore on broken pieces. And as I'm looking on shore at these broken pieces, understand broken pieces in your life can represent two things. Broken pieces can either suggest that you've been through a storm, that you've lost a whole lot of things, or broken pieces can mean that you made it out alive. And tonight I've got to define the language that broken pieces speak to me in my life. I am not going to allow broken pieces to tell me what I've lost or who I've lost. I have declared that broken pieces ought to tell me that I've made it out alive. I've made it out with, with my mind intact. I, I've made it out with my family. I, I've made it out having made bad decisions in my past, but I've made it out having been forgiven. I've, I've made it out still standing. I've made it out with good health. Some of us have got to be able to look at our broken pieces and thank God for what we have coming out of some storms and some seasons of interruption in our lives. So can we just pause for a moment on this Sabbath evening and thank God that broken pieces helped us to make it to dry land. 
But I need y'all to understand that even though the storm has taken place and they've made it to dry lands, uh, they are not out of the way of some problematic situations. Because understand that you've got a bad mixture when you are dealing simply with being wet and being cold. Because whenever you've got some wet clothing that are laid on the human skin and you've got some cold weather that is lurking, you've got a danger that hypothermia is right around the corner. And so understand these are individuals Yes, they've made it off the ship. Yes, they've made it across the water, but they are dealing with the lingering possibility that they may still lose their lives if they catch hypothermia. And so I need y'all to understand the Bible speaks about some individuals who are on this beach. These are individuals that the Bible defines as natives of this land. But the Bible says these natives show up and they do something interesting. The Bible says that these natives show up and they kindle a fire. Did y'all hear me? These natives were in their homes. They were minding their business. They could have been chilling with their families, but instead of being home, hanging with their families, staying in their comfort zone, the Bible says that they got up and they went to the beach. They met these individuals who are inmates who came off of this ship and they kindle a fire to keep them warm. And the Bible says something that stopped me in my tracks. The Bible literally says that they showed them unusual kindness. Did y'all hear me? Don't miss this. Don't miss this. The Bible says that the natives show these inmates unusual kindness. Now I got to stop because I'm not a Bible reading Christian. I'm a Bible studying Christian. And when I went to interrogate this text, I pulled it into the interrogation room and I began to tell the text that you've got to tell me the truth and nothing but the truth. And when the text began to speak to me, the text began to, I asked the text, what is unusual kindness? And I went through the text and I could not find unusual kindness because in my mind, it's just common sense that if somebody is wet, you give them something dry to put on. If somebody is cold you, if you're, and you're from Brooklyn, you give them Timberlands and a North Face and a Scully. Uh, if somebody is hungry, you give them food to eat. If, if somebody is broke as a joke and they ain't got no fun, they got no money in the tank, understand, you go ahead and you give them some money. That does not seem like unusual kindness. That just seemed like common sense. So interrogating the text, I had to ask, what is unusual kindness and where was it in the text? And understand the text began to speak back to me because I realized unusual kindness wasn't about what they did. Unusual kindness was about who they did it for. Y'all missed it. Y'all missed it. Y'all missed it tonight. Understand, understand unusual kindness is not just about what you do. Unusual kindness is also about who you do it for. Are you willing? Are you able? Are you challenged tonight that uh, a kindness is not just about what we do for others, but it's about who we do it for? Can you be kind to people who have a different skin color than you? Can you be kind to people who don't share your same economic status? Can you be kind to people who live in a different area code and a different zip code and a different area of the city or live on the outskirts where nobody sees them, knows them, or connects with them? Can you be kind with people who don't vote the way that you vote? Y'all didn't hear me, y'all. They might not vote blue, but they vote red. Or they don't vote red, they vote blue. Or they vote independent. Can you still be kind to them? Can you be kind to them based on the voting flag that they've placed on their lawn, even if it doesn't say the candidate who you're voting for? Can you be kind to people who are different than you? Can you be kind to people who did things that you don't endorse? Can you be kind to people who have made mistakes and did things that you wouldn't do and you're not proud of? Can you be kind to people who fall down and make mistakes and need the grace of God just like you need the grace of God? Can you be kind to people? The Bible doesn't challenge us to be kind. The Bible is challenging us tonight. Can you give people unusual kindness? Kindness that other people won't give. Kindness that, that people who are not part of our faith won't give. Can you be kind to people who, who have a different religious belief? Can you be kind to people who are LGBTQ? Can you be kind to people who are different than you? Can you be kind to people who are Muslim and Buddhist or atheist? Can you be kind to people who are transgender and gay or bisexual? Can you be kind to people who are Indian and Latino Caucasian, Caribbean, or Black, can you be kind to people tonight? 
Tonight, I want you guys to know their unusual kindness was not just about what they did, but it was just as important as who they did it for. Who did they do it for? They did it for prisoners. They did it for inmates. They did it for people who are locked out, left out, and unlucky. People who are written off. Check this out. They did it for people who could not vote because they had a felony record. They did it for people who were viewed as doing hideous sins that we would not have done. They did it for people. Did y'all listen to me? They kindled the fire and treated people kind who were disfellowshipped from our church. People who were laid off from their jobs. Individuals who drove, who, who didn't even drive cars, but individuals who were poor and probably walked everywhere. They did it for people who were different. Tonight, I am challenging us, church. There ought to be nothing that prevents you from giving unusual kindness to others. Because the last time I check, God gave us unusual kindness. And I've got to tell you, check this out, y'all. They have unusual kindness. They're treating them well. They've got handcuffs on their hands. They got shackles on their feet. They've got orange jumpsuits on, and it's very evident that they've made some mistakes and that they have some bad past. But they're sitting around this fire, and the Bible says that there is a man named Paul who sees that the fire is about to go out, and he goes to collect branches to feed the fire. And I've got to pause for a second because y'all have got to understand what's actually happening here. Understand it's not one of the natives that are feeding the fire. It's one of the inmates, one of the prisoners, one of the individuals who were a felon. He is, the he is the one who's preparing to feed the fire. And I've got to pause and tell you for a second, never let your past, what you've done and where you've been prevent you from serving God and loving other people. Did y'all hear me? Never let your transcript, the alphabet soup letters behind your name, what people remember about you, what other people have said about you, where you've been, what you've done, and where you've gone prevent you from serving other people. God allows sinners to serve him. Did y'all hear what I just said to you? Understand the Bible says that Paul, who should have been written off, who should have been allowed to leave, who should have had an ounce of trust, God allows him to go and pick up branches. But let me tell y'all something, I gotta give y'all an admonition tonight. While I'm inviting you to serve, I need y'all to understand that you've gotta be careful of the things you pick up when you come out of storms. Y'all Don't miss this tonight. You gotta be careful of the things you pick up when you come out of storms. Understand the enemy will always line up things and people and, and places and, and things that we, places we shouldn't go and things we shouldn't do. The devil will always allow things to come in our path when he is trying to prevent us from being who God wants us to be. And so the, the devil arranges it. Check this out. Life arranges it. That simply as Paul is picking up the branches, the Bible says that when he's picking up the branches, a viper leaps out and hangs onto his hand. Did y'all hear what I just said? You got to be careful of the things you pick up when you come out of storms. What am I telling you tonight? Check this out. The Bible says that when Paul is bit by this viper, that he shakes it off into the fire. I got to pause for a second. Check this out. Shaking off things into the fire don't mean that the thing did not hurt us. Shaking off things into the fire don't mean that events did not injure us. Did y'all hear me? Shaking things off into the fire don't mean that you didn't encounter things that were meant to suck the life and sanity out of your life. Shaking off things into the fire simply means that you will not allow it to stop you from becoming who God wants you to be. In essence, in essence, in essence, in essence, shaking off into the fire doesn't mean the bite didn't hurt. And it doesn't mean, all it simply means is that it will not accomplish what it was intended. It's okay to allow things to hurt us. It's okay to be hurt and to be sad for a season, but never let a bite strip you of your destiny. Never let anything stop you from coming to the throne of grace. Never let anything stop you from praying to God. Never let anything stop you from being a member of God's church. Never let anything distract you from having confidence that the gates of hell will never prevail against God's church. You've got to stay in this thing. Never let a snake bite affect you that you are willing to get up and walk out. You've got to stay put. And I've got to tell you, man, I had to ask the question, man, because check this out. Paul is in a situation that because of the snake bite, the Bible says that he's checked into a court 
that he should never have been checked into. Understand, the only court that Paul was supposed to be headed to was the court in Rome. But Paul winds up in the court of other people's opinions. And you've got to be careful of being hauled into the court of other people's opinions or the opinions of social media. Some of us have been indicted in the court of Facebook, TikTok, Instagram, and Twitter. And I've got to tell you that you can't let other people's thoughts of you and views of you prevent you from being who God has called you to be. Did y'all hear what I'm saying? Don't let your value be based on other people's posts and other people's 168 characters on Twitter. Did y'all hear what I just said? What am I telling you today? You've got to know who you are and who you serve and what your identity is. Your identity comes from God. Your identity comes from grace. Your identity comes from the image of God. Your identity comes from the fact that God made you and could have chosen to not make you, but still chose to make you knowing the mistakes you were going to make. Hallelujah. Amen. Despite my sins, despite where I've been, God still chose because God doesn't know the beginning from the end, but God knows from the end from the beginning, which means he knew what I was going to do, where I was going to be, how I was going to still mess up, but still chose to make Abraham Henry. I'm so grateful that tonight I will not allow myself to sit in courts that I don't belong in, but I will only allow myself to be subject to the court of God and the official courts of this land. And tonight I want to encourage you to always know who your judge is. How did Paul, how did Paul, how did Paul, y'all, are y'all listening to me tonight? Tonight I want to challenge you, man. Yes, we got to call sin by its rightful name. Yes, we got to call sin by its rightful name. Sin will not be allowed in heaven, but understand, know what God hates. God hates sin, but never hates the sinner tonight. And I'm so grateful that in my life, God hated the mess out of my sin, even when I was in love with my sin. But God loved me more than he hated the sin in my life. He removed the sin from my life. He's still removing the sin in my life because I am a sinner saved by grace. I'm still messing up every single day, but I'm still mad enough to go on my knees each and every night, lift my hands to the throne of God and say, God, thank you, God, for your forgiveness. And God, help me to be better tomorrow than who I was today. Why was Paul able to not roll over and play dead? Let me tell y'all something. Y'all listen to me. Why was Paul, the Bible says, check this out. This is the core of people's opinions in this text. Understand the Bible says, that Paul, the moment that he's bit, everyone is sitting around and waiting for him to die. Now that's a crazy indictment. When the jury has come out and said, this person ought to be dead. However, Paul sits there and because of the grace of God, the Bible says that the impact it should have had, it did not have. And don't get it wrong, it wasn't because of who he was and what his last name was and what degrees he had and his job working history. The only reason why that snake bite did not have the effect it should have was because of the grace of God. And we've got to be thankful for the grace of God. And we got to be careful of judging other people who encounter the grace of God. And the reason why is, is because the same measure of grace that we give on other people is the same measure of grace that we will receive. And tonight, what I want to challenge Facebook, I love y'all. I love y'all. I love y'all. And I'm speaking as a sinner saved by grace, but a sinner nonetheless. Tonight, what I want to tell you tonight is I want to tell y'all a story. This is how I'm going to land this thing tonight. Tonight, I need to tell y'all a story as to why Paul was able to keep it together. Why Paul, after he's bit, should have been written off, should have been left for dead. Why Paul is still able to hold it together. Let me tell y'all something, man. I remember when I was pastoring in my first district about five years ago, Understand, I had a guest speaker for the weekend. He did a phenomenal job preaching. I'm not going to name his name because he may argue the details and semantics of this story. But tonight, I'm telling this story. And I need y'all to know that after the preacher had preached, we were getting ready to take the preacher back to the airport, my wife and I. And as I'm headed uh, to prepare to take the preacher back to the airport, him and his wife are hungry. And so I took them to the only place that you take a preacher on a Sunday morning to eat. And that's Cracker Barrel. Y'all don't know anything about the gospel of Cracker Barrel. Let me tell y'all something. Sunday mornings is a hectic time to go to Cracker Barrel because Sunday mornings, everybody knows that when you show up to Cracker Barrel, there's going to be at least an hour wait. And so we went into Cracker Barrel and y'all know how it goes. I gave them my last name. I told them my name was Henry. They told me that there was a 45 to an hour wait so I can go ahead and take the little buzzing device they gave me and go sit down on the outside of Cracker Barrel. And so I went and I got my buzzer. 
I'm sitting down on the white rocking chairs. Y'all know Cracker Barrel. Y'all know the gospel of Cracker Barrel. So I'm sitting down on the white chairs. I'm rocking with my boy who's a preacher. Uh, we're both sitting down and our wives are sitting on the other rocking chairs. They're on their phones. And as I'm sitting down on the rocking chairs, there's only one thing you do at Cracker Barrel on Sunday morning if you're not eating, and that's play checkers. And so there's a checkerboard outside. Y'all know the gospel of Cracker Barrel. So I'm sitting down and I begin to start playing checkers against this other pastor who will remain nameless because I ain't going to tell y'all that it's Pastor Nicardo Delahay. So I didn't tell y'all it's Pastor Nicardo Delahay. Y'all don't need to know it's Pastor Nicardo Delahay, but I'm going to tell y'all this story. And so as I'm playing checkers against this uh, nameless preacher, understand as we're playing checkers, it starts to rain outside of Cracker Barrel. And understand as the rain starts coming down, understand y'all know that people start coming in and that the restaurant is crowded, people are waiting on the inside, the outside is crowded, so everybody and their mama is all up on me as I'm playing checkers in front of Cracker Barrel. And so everybody begins to watch us play checkers because it's raining and everyone's watching us. And as I begin to start to play, uh, this went from a, a completely fearless game to now a very fearful game because I've got 40 to 50 people watching us play Cracker Barrel and God knows he did not make a loser and my wife knows she didn't marry a loser so I've got to win this game y'all ain't with me this is the gospel of Cracker Barrel and so while I'm playing checkers against this nameless pastor understand within a few moments I'm down and he's up within a few moments I've got three pieces left and he's winning the game almost all his pieces are on his side and y'all know how checkers goes there are three pieces by four pieces there are 12 pieces on the board I've got three pieces left. Everybody's watching me. I've even got an Asian brother over my shoulder holding his hand as he's brushing his hair and I'm sitting there and I'm wondering, God don't let me down. And so I began to pray ahead a, a and a silent prayer in my head. I began to say, God, you've got to make sure I win this game because I'm not going to lose. And so as I continue playing checkers, y'all won't believe it. Man, within just about six minutes, that's right, y'all didn't hear me? Within six minutes, uh, if you look at the table, I only had three pieces left, but within about six minutes, I won the game. Y'all didn't hear me, y'all? I won the game of checkers. I won the game of checkers in six minutes. I only had three pieces. I collected all his pieces, and eventually everybody starts looking. Everybody starts talking. Everybody starts cheering. I won the game of checkers outside of Cracker Barrel. I'm a world-renowned checker player. I should have left ministry and became a checker player, but thank God I didn't do that. Let me tell you something, man. As we're sitting down to eat, the preacher begins to ask me a question. As he plays, as we're sitting there at the table, we finally got our food. The question he asked me is, bro, how did you win that game? Bro, you had three pieces left. I was winning. I was up. He said, man, Abraham, how did you win the game? And I smiled and told him. I said, I had three pieces left. I said, you took most of my pieces. I said, you took all of my time and you almost got all the attention. But there was one thing you missed. He said, what did I miss? I said, I had a king in my corner. He said, what? I said, that's right. I said, I only had three pieces left. But the reason why I won is because even though I barely had anything left, the one thing I had left was a king in my corner. And tonight I came to tell a kinder in this place that if you've got a king in your corner, you can't lose this thing. Tonight you've got a king in your corner and I need you to be encouraged and I need you to hold on and I need you to hold fast to know that God says he will come and he who will come shall come and he will not tarry. Be encouraged and stop looking about everything that's going on around you and learn to trust that God is in your corner because tonight you've got a king in your corner. And tonight I came to tell you, man, tonight I came to tell you, let's stay prayerful. Tonight I came to tell you, don't let anything distract you from having a Christian character. Tonight I came to tell you, don't let anything cause you to not be kind to everybody. Though tonight I, I came to tell you, be careful about the being the judge and jury in some people's lives because just as much as you serve the jury in some people's lives, one day you're going to be the defendant looking for a good lawyer. And tonight I came to tell you that tonight we are all equal. We stand before the grace of God. Tonight I came to tell you that we call sin by its rightful name and yes, we condemn sin, but understand we still love sinners. Tonight I came to tell the Wakanda church, let us stick 
stick together. Tonight I came to tell you, let's hold fast to God's unchanging hand. Today I came to tell you that God loves you beyond anything you could do, and there's nothing you can do about it. And tonight I came to tell you that if you've been some places and you've done some things, that God is not done with you yet. If you've got breath in your body, if you can twiddle your fingers, and if you can make decisions with your mind, understand that God still has a purpose and a plan for you. Tonight I came to tell you that before the beginning of time began, understand God created your purpose. Did y'all hear me? You are not an afterthought. You are not a mistake. You didn't just wind up here by accident. Understand God didn't go to Vegas and go to Caesars and go to table number 14 and ask to put some chips on number nine black. Understand God didn't go to Vegas when he made you. Check this out. Understand the Bible says, check this out. The Bible said to Jeremiah, as he says to us, that understand God created a purpose for us and then we were fastened. In essence, God created a mission and a purpose that nobody else could accomplish except you. And God chose to dress that mission in your skin. And tonight you've got hope. Tonight you have chance. And tonight you have opportunity. Tonight, God is not done with you. Tonight, God loves you. Would you join this sinner? Would you join this man who's made mistakes in approaching the throne of God tonight? Tonight, I'm sorry if I've made too much noise, but I'm a black preacher. Y'all forgive me. Not only am I a black preacher, before I'm a black preacher, before I'm an educated preacher, before I'm a positioned preacher, I am a preacher who is a sinner. And I'm so grateful that God stepped into my life with the countless mistakes that I've made, the countless things that I've done, the negative way I've treated people. Did y'all hear me, y'all? This high school dropout preacher, this preacher who dropped out of high school, God didn't throw me out and leave me for dead. God still chose to keep his hands on me. Tonight, I've got a testimony, y'all. This preacher who's sitting in front of you, I got some alphabet soup letters. They call me doctor. I'm a high school dropout, and it took me six, almost seven years to finish my bachelor's degree. Not because not because I was dumb, but because I was broke. But God still worked with me. Took me forever to get into ministry. Never thought I was going to make it into ministry because of where I've been and the things that I've done. But God still found a place for me. And I'm so grateful. And I will always have gratitude before my maker, my king. Don't let the indictment of other people ever stop you from being who God wants you to be and to go where God wants you to go. And tonight I'm preaching not from my head, but I'm preaching from my heart. We've gone through some tough times. This is a tough time for our country. This is a tough time for humanity because of coronavirus. And I'm going to speak directly tonight. Tonight, this is a tough time for God's church. It's been a tough time over these last two weeks. But guess what? We don't give up and walk out. We stay put. We treat people kind. We love everybody. And we ask God for direction. We don't stop paying tithe. Did y'all hear me? We don't walk out and chance for our membership. We don't start another church. We trust God. We condemn sin. We treat everybody kind and love everybody. We extend the same grace to everyone that was given to us. And we do the right thing. Tonight, the reason why we can do the right thing is because Jesus did the right thing. Jesus did what I could never do and what you could never do. He died on the cross for you. And tonight, I'm so grateful. I'm a recipient of the grace of God. If you ask me where I've graduated from, I've graduated from Grace University. And I'm so grateful that that's the one degree I will never give out. And it's the one group of soup letters I will always hold behind my name. I'm a child of God. And tonight, I'm so grateful. I'm so honored to have received the invitation to be with you guys. I'm not the greatest preacher, but I am the most grace-received preacher. And tonight, I'm so grateful for the invitation. And tonight, I want to give you guys an invitation to join me as I come one more time to the grace of God. Every time I do an altar call, I'm not inviting people to come to me. I'm joining them as we all stand together at the foot of Jesus. And so so tonight, Facebook and Wakinda, would y'all join me as we stand at the foot of Jesus to pray for us, our families, our community, our church, our country with all these politics, and the world with coronavirus. Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, God, I'm so grateful tonight. God, how could you choose a preacher like me? But God, I'm so grateful for it. God, thank you that you chose a preacher like me to share your word. God, I don't preach the gospel of just the Bible. I preach the gospel that was done in my life. The Jesus who stepped in and changed me, the Jesus who stepped in and touched me, and the Jesus who stepped in and is still working on me. And Father, I preach tonight, not as someone who gives indictments, but of someone who rightfully 
needs a good lawyer. And I'm so grateful you gave me one. You gave me Jesus. And Father, tonight we need Jesus even more right now. Tonight, as we're in the middle of a pandemic still, we've not forgotten. Father, what keeps us is not just masks. It's not just washing our hands. It's the grace of God. God, thank you for life. And God, thank you for it more abundantly. God, tonight we pray also for our country as it's a political whirlwind. God, I was praying the third candidate was going to step in. Watching these two, uh, 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 whatever they call them, debates. <laughs> God, I, I was standing there trying to figure out, are one of these two individuals really going to be our president? But Father, yes, they will. And Father, I still believe that you will join them in that office. And so Father, tonight we pray for the politics of our country. Father, we pray that as we approach election day, that God, you will challenge us not to sit out, but to step up and to do our part and to cast our votes and to not just look at party, but to look at how it aligns with your word. Father, tonight, we thank you and we ask that you'll be with our church. Um, Father, we have moments of disappointment. And if I can be honest, I've caused moments of disappointment. But God, thank you that you wouldn't allow any sin that I did to be something that shuts down or stops your church. Because the church is much bigger than a person. It's about you. And it's about your purpose. And tonight, be with your church and hold us in the palm of your hands. Father, I pray for your grace across everybody. I pray that you will remove any type of judgment from us. Let us judge sin, but not judge people. We'll leave that to you, God. And Father, I pray for grace and compassion. I pray for love. I pray for open arms that we can give everybody who's hurting right now. And Father, I pray in a special way that you'll even bless this the group. God, you created it. It came out of an amazing time. And Father, they are still trailblazing. Father, I thank you for this. And tonight, I pray that you would forgive us all, give us encouragement, continue to provide grace. And Father, I pray that you continue to bless the upcoming days of this week. Thank you for the Sabbath of God. And Father, we thank you for these things tonight. Bless us and keep us. In Jesus' name we pray. Let everyone type amen. Family, I'm so honored to be with you guys. Love y'all. And uh, we'll get together soon once in name. Once again, my name is Abraham Henry, and I'm honored to have been your servant tonight. God bless y'all, and holla at your boy.